The Absent Therapist by Will Eaves Funny how seeing someone swallow in their sleep is my next As I'm sure you know, Isabel is away at area meeting today, giving a talk on the original gay Quakers. <laughs> it's original as in the first, as opposed to very creative, although I suppose there's bound to be some overlap. At any rate, it, it sounds fascinating, and we look forward to hearing all about it on Isabel's return from Croydon. She also has the appointments diary with her, alas, so we're short on notices this week. And in fact, there isn't anything that comes to mind at the moment that I think we need to be made aware of. But could I, on my own account, put out a call for any unwanted balls of double knitting wool friends may have? The collection this month is for the Sailors Association, and I use the wool to knit hats for that excellent charity, which then distributes them at Christmas time in their hampers. To all the branches of the Merchant Navy, it doesn't matter if you have odd colours, or not much of one colour and plenty of another, I can do stripes. I used to do jumpers with quite complex patterns, but I'm not up to that anymore. So it's hats mostly, because they're quite simple and very warm, of course. One young man wrote to me to say that he'd worn four of my hats, one on top of the other in a storm off Jutland, when it was goodness knows how many, some horrific number of degrees below zero. He got some shampoo in the same hamper, which he said was less useful, for reasons the enclosed photograph made clear. Owen has the kind of lack of self-awareness that makes you think it must be a dare. Him seeing what he can get away with before someone says, are you or have you recently gone mad? I like him. I like him. But he needs his whole mental world completely realigned. He was telling the office the other day, well, speaking on the phone, but shouting, shouting, shouting with the door open so we could all hear how French people mistake him for a native because of his amazing accent. Trying to make it sound as if he was being modest, you know. Oh, I'm not all that fluent. I mean, I get by in conversation perfectly well, but the accent fools people because it's really very authentic sounding, so I'm told. People think I must be French, you see. And I thought, really? Who are these people, Owen? The relatives of Helen Keller. Brenda at the next desk is a fairly casual racist. I mean, she's not knowingly a racist, but then that's almost the definition of casual racism, isn't it? She fancies herself as a bit of a singer too. And I heard her say to Lola, who really is a singer and in a good band too, don't take this the wrong way, but only black people can sing the blues. Lola didn't react for a bit. Tap, 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 on she goes. 
and finally replies, looking down at the keyboard like she's lost something, Well, I'm black, and I can't sing the blues. No, love, Brenda says, patting Lola's arm. I'm not saying you can't sing the blues. I'm saying you can. No, wasn't he? He knew all the trains and all the platforms at Flinders Street. Well, I never. Extraordinary confidence. How old did she say? Five. Five. Five next September. He's only four. That's really quite unusual. Well, his grandparents, they said. Although these days. You know, I think I know the man he means at Flinders Street. The one who's nice, yes. And he's right about the stop, you know, because you can walk it from the station. But if I were you, I'd carry on up and then change at Swanston and Collins and get any of the trams going across the city. No, it doesn't matter. They all head in the same direction. It's much quicker that way. Oh, yes, but wasn't he? They didn't like him because he was self-sufficient, which is not to say he was rich, because he wasn't. He was just the wrong sort of homosexual. That's to say, close and mysteriously confident about men and sex, not extrovert, needy and therefore harmless. I heard the usual stuff. It's a selfish life, it's not nice for the children, I have to explain about the strangers going in and out and so on. Did they envy him his solitude and freedom? Does the Pope shit in the woods? He told me a wonderful story once about some man who came round for sex and said, give me a blow job then. And Terry said, that's not very romantic. And the man sighed and said, all right, give me a blow job in the rain. Body Electronics is a holistic protocol with meditative technologies and nutritional programs. There's a seminar I attend every Thursday evening. Jeff. Jeff is an inspirational teacher. Everyone loves Jeff. He's one of only two BE teachers in the States. We start with the anointment, which is where you rub non-alcohol based peppermint extract on your temples to facilitate concentration and ward off the negative thoughts. Then we get into the discussion, which is, well, it's, it's really, it's another means of transcendence. So the great thing about BE is that it's an eternal process. You don't just realize the beauty of each instant. You get to live forever. We have four bodies, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And death is a state of mind that the rejuvenative mental body can overcome. Here's hoping. Well, I, yeah, I, I do think I have a different perspective to the other members of the group. Yes, yes. Well, I have a different set of expectations, you might say. It's just the niceness and the calm that I value. I mean, I have objections to the the immortal part of it, because I don't see what it can do about sudden death, plane crashes and earthquakes and wars. I don't see how I can rejuvenate if I'm in a hundred bits and pieces. And if we're immortal, why are we all different ages? But, but I don't want to pick holes. It's the feeling of being in a group of nice people. I feel safe. And feeling safe and calm is a great analgesic, by the way. My parents are on the East Coast, Westchester, and it's hard for them. And I get everywhere on my own, and for as long as I have left, I choose this. This is my car. It was nice meeting you.
Funny how seeing someone swallow in their sleep, lying next to you, can bring a lump to your throat. You think, I love this person. You can never tell them what you've seen. You tie a wish knot inside your head. Well, if you were offended, I apologise. I was offended too. I don't like the language you use either. I don't dispute my inability to be appropriate. It's not that I object to. It's the air of moral sanction that hangs over that dreadful word and the way it passes off self-importance as self-restraint, as in, this is just my opinion, but it is an irreducibly objective truth that I am right in this matter, as in all others. What you have to realise, Dominic, is that I use words like fucking cunt very freely. Mostly, I think, because of my background in news and broadcasting and institutions like the BBC, which can leave even the most resilient people very paranoid. People much more resilient and better equipped to deal with the sort of Freud-blenching manipulation that goes on in such environments than I am or ever could be. And so, when I said you were a fucking cunt in that last email, which wasn't obviously intended to reach you, or any of your close relations, apart from Gabriel, to whom I have the good fortune to be married, I didn't mean by it quite what you might expect. The words, as I use them, don't carry the weight others associate with them. That said, it is true that I find you objectionable and that I hate everything you stand for. You belong to a sort of sect, don't you? You cut off your children from the outside world and bar them from watching TV because you can't deal with the outside world and TV frightens you. And you're a violent homophobe. Or would be if you could be bothered to lift a baseball bat. What have you got against Francis? He's training to be a priest, for God's sake. What happened to ecumenicism? Granted, he has terrible taste in men, an inexplicable succession of so-called lads, with curiously complete recall of every Streisand lyric in existence. But why should that bother you? Come to think of it, I stand by everything I said, even though I'm sorry your mum had to read it. How is she? The ferret box had two compartments, made from marine plywood and modelled on old pencil cases, the ones with sliding tops. I gave each compartment its own gate at the end. Separate gates are a good idea, because ferrets tend to want to escape as a group. For the shoulder strap, I used an old seat belt. When Dad unwrapped it, he said, That's handy, and I could see he was pleased. Neil and Ursula are both epidemiologists, which makes it sound like one of them caught it off the other, but they only work three days a week each, and that rather brings them down to earth in my eyes. I suppose you have to hope that the epidemic doesn't strike on the one day they haven't got covered. Anyway, there we were, in the shack, on a glorious morning, about to have breakfast, and I've put the kettle on and put some tea in the pot, and Neil watches me, and calmly picks up the pot, and tips the perfectly good dry leaves into the bin. Because, I imagine, I assume, I haven't warmed the pot first. With less socially awkward companions and with more of a guiding intuition of their humanity, I confess I'm put off by the little whirs and clicks coming from their children, I might have pointed out that you warm a ceramic pot so that it doesn't crack, whereas aluminium conducts so you don't have to. I'm sorry, I say. Why do I feel as if I always have to apologise? I'm sorry. I always use bags at home. I'm lazy, I'm afraid. And Ursula replies with a sort of pent-up literal-mindedness. Oh no, it isn't laziness. We just prefer loose-leaf tea. Well, I wasn't saying they were lazy, was I? I was saying I'm lazy. Although the irony is I'm not.
I was prepared to cry over the poor fish and chips. The fish was a square frozen fillet, not fresh, and I kept apologising to David, saying, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. We should have gone to the other place. He didn't seem that bothered, but I know he's got a lot on his mind at the moment, and so I tend to inflate the significance of small details, little disappointments. I'm the problem, because I read them all as potential disasters, which I can see isn't very helpful. I felt that miserable battered square was a betrayal of what fish and chips ought to be. And when we got down onto the seashore, it was as if the wind had blown away not only my tears, but the forty years separating me from my childhood. We walked along the beach to the war fortifications. Mallow grows along the cliff tops and blue geraniums, and even from the bottom you can see the bees going wild over them. There's a lover's lane pathway leading up from the rocks to St Peter's Road, and on the steps a peculiar child had written in chalk, Mother Mary is a spastic. Is your mum's name Mary, or are you just a moron? I walked past it as if I hadn't seen it, and couldn't stop wondering, who is that child, and what are his parents like? Is he a bully? Mother of Mary? It's a girl, of course. Who is she bullying, then? We had time for some tea before the train back and sat at a cafe table looking down a narrow, half-timbered alley, which from our point of view seemed to end in a wall of choppy green water. I've always liked the sight of the sea between houses. The feeling I have about it is distantly related to the thrill of watching tidal waves swamp city streets in disaster movies. I like the reminder that we're scum on the surface of things, and that out there, not far away, is an irresistible force waiting for us. It should be terrifying, but for some reason I find it consoling. Some people find the vastness of the sky at night frightening for similar reasons, and I don't. That's what David and I have in common, I think. A tolerance of the big fears. We should have been astronomers. It's as if a skunk went in there, shat itself, died, and the whole lot got turned into a sandwich. And there are queues. That's what I don't understand. Many people, at all hours of the day, who want incontinent skunk sandwiches. Now is really not a great time to visit Oklahoma City. Everyone's kind of moving about in the days, and we're all so distraught. I'm sorry? Well, I, I know where the Northwest 39th Expressway is, at least ways I've driven on it. Somewhere nearby? No, I don't have that information. Oh, a hotel! Now, wait a minute. This is so dumb. I can't seem to find... The West Side Y? Well, I know that's over on Martin Luther King. You can try them, sure. But it's in a black part of town. I don't know if that matters to you. You, you don't have a car? You're on foot? Without a car? We didn't talk much, but I did feel close to him, I suppose. His actions were prompt, you know, which made him seem angry, but he wasn't at all. That rabbit's getting too fat, he said one day, pointing to the hutch. And by evening it was in the pot. It happened several times. I bought you a rabbit, he'd say a few weeks later, or a guinea pig, or a hamster. 
the guinea pig lived in a Victorian parrot cage with the door I left open one evening. Well, the ferret got in, and I came downstairs to find the guinea pig with its head sort of eaten out, excavated like a cream egg. I must have been upset. I don't remember. The thing I really couldn't get used to was the sad dogs at Southall Livestock Market. You'd go along and there'd be these whippets and lurches and collie crosses dragged around by men in short-sleeved shirts with pierced ears and unblinking eyes. The dogs had for sale signs around their necks. Some of them barked endlessly at nothing. The others were silent. I hated that almost as much as I hated school. I didn't go very often. The careers advisor asked me what I wanted to do when I left school, and I said I didn't mind. Well, you must have some idea, she cried. It's important to have aspirations. I didn't say I didn't have aspirations, I replied. I just don't care what job I do. Bang. Detention. Letter from school. Mum said, I don't know what the fuss is about. You answered her questions, didn't you? Oh, Mum was kind. So was Dad. They were kind underneath. Whisper went for my baby rabbits once. She was a working dog. What do you expect? She got through the fence and knocked them about the lawn. And Mum ran out to where there were these pathetic pieces of white scattered over the grass, shouting, Don't look! Don't look! She picked up the limp bodies and put them in a basket. I think I did cry then. Don't look! But I did, and I pointed. And suddenly there were six little white heads and six pairs of sticking up ears peeping over the rim of the basket. They'd been knocked out, that's all. She died when she was 60. She came back from the hospital a few days before the end, and they sat on the sofa holding hands. Would she have been proud of me? She wouldn't have minded what I did. They didn't need to say the things we say now. We're not closing libraries, we're investing in libraries. We're upgrading libraries to attract people who wouldn't normally use libraries. That was the touch paper moment as far as I was concerned. Use the website, he went on. You can leave a comment. We want people to share their experience with us. What can that mean? What can it possibly have to do with reading a book in a library? I did shout. I shouldn't have, but I did. I banged the table and the mic jumped. A woman behind the glass made wheeling and pointing signs. I said, people don't go to libraries to share an experience or even to have one. They go to libraries to be on their own, to get away from sharing. We have to share everything. I'm sick of it. We all are. I don't want to share my experience of seeking out solitude and a bit of peace and quiet with a book. I want the old libraries back, where smelly old men went to avoid their wives. After 60 years, what is there left to share? I want people to stop talking about their experiences. The man from the council was quiet on the way down the lift. I said sorry, but he ignored me and barged through the doors and fell over his bike. I stood at the top of the steps while he fiddled with the chain. He turned round and yelled, Sexist! That's what he took away from our encounter. Corinne worked for a number of sub-Saharan NGOs and charities, but never lost a sense of entitlement with roots much closer to home. You can have Australia, she said to her emigrating sister, if I can keep Africa. I was interested in your remarks on teaching and writing because I was a teacher myself for many years. I was fairly creative before I went into teaching, albeit in the social sciences, and I was very productive, perhaps creative isn't the word, getting on, but certainly inspired, as soon as I finished, and not at all during. What I mean is I, 
I don't think the two ways of being are compatible. And I like teaching, I did. But nurturing and doing are utterly different. Oh, I know, I know. Teaching is creative. We're all creative, aren't we? But that's like the sad lady who once said to me, I'm a nice person, really, after she'd knifed her father. He was a monster and deserved to be knifed, in my opinion, but that's by the by. We're all nice. We're all creative. I'd get out of it as soon as I can if I were you. I'm an ex-Jew Catholic convert, and my wife Chris is from Uruguay. She's not too happy about my shift in orthodoxies, and I'm none too clear about it myself. I can see some kind of logical fallacy, certainly. If the commandment says, honour thy father and thy mother, then I guess that means I should have stayed Jewish. At least I waited until my father was dead before converting. I'm a geologist for the government, and I'm researching a nuclear facility near Los Alamos. It's amazing how you can do this technical thing and still have these ideological disputes with colleagues who are highly, highly respected geologists in their own right, but creationists at the same time. I'm in an awful way with one guy, whom I like very much as a person, but he is obsessed with explaining away everything as a biblical relic. So, on his view... All the limestones from here to the canyon are carbonates that were reworked by the flood, okay? He has nothing to say about the classic reefs that show up here. He is in total denial that New Mexico had any kind of coastal environment. It's crazy! And the dinosaur tracks in the Mesozoic rocks? How can they be late in the flood, like he says? I thought everything outside the ark was supposed to be dead. Being a Jew Catholic sometimes feels like the least of my problems. Simon Smith had a lazy eye and smelt of soap. He also had a pair of yellow swimming trunks and a line of hair like a fuse rising from the drawstring up to his belly. His mother used to foster kids. Some were long stay, some were infants. Only there while the adoption papers were being drawn up. They had a baby called Spike with blue eyes, tufty blonde hair and a massive smile. Lucky Spike. Lucky people who got Spike. Poor girl who gave him away or had him taken from her. Simon's dad worked in the factory at the bottom of the garden and took me into Simon's bedroom one day and told me that the new factory shed cost one million pounds to build. I nodded. Simon had a leather jacket unlike anyone else's, unlike any I've ever seen. It was maroon and padded. He looked fantastic. He gave me rides home and sat at my upright piano and said, How do you do this then? And I stood behind him and put my arms around him to show him a few chords. And he didn't flinch. I punish the saint. It is like a punishment until the thing happens. You can pray to the idol for health, harvest, prosperity in the normal way, but if misfortune occurs, we go like this and this and this. The saints are walled up by mothers if their sons are missing or get kidnapped by Indians. When I was little, I knew a shepherd boy who disappeared for nearly a year and his mother had a wooden saint for the safety of her son. She buries the effigy. One day, she hears knocking behind the plaster, and her saint falls out of his place in the wall. The next day, her son returns home. I like this punishing. It goes back a long, long way. I descend from the penitentes originally, well, we, we, we no longer beat ourselves with sticks, claro que si, but still we have visions. God is everywhere. Our Lady of Guadalupe, the local shrine, remembers the woman who saw Christ in a tortilla. And the church was moved. A farmer found a saint in his backyard. He took it to his church and gave it to the priest. 
in his field the next day, he sees the same image staring up at him from the dirt. Eventually, because this goes on for many weeks, they move the church to his fields because it is a sign that the building belongs there instead. On the second day of the Turing Conference, he cornered me and started explaining distributed intelligence, which as far as I could see is a dressy term for old-fashioned cooperation. The idea that lots of small computers working away on something are probably going to come up with a solution much faster than one big box of lights. Two hands better than one, etc. I agreed with what the professor was saying, and he carried on regardless, repeating himself in a slightly peevish way as if I hadn't understood, or, more likely, couldn't be expected to understand. It's more than that, he kept saying. It's not just that. There's more. It was peculiar. He seemed to want to hang on to the knowledge, whatever it was, not to distribute it. And then he began coughing again and people started moving away. The director is beginning to lose control, I fear. Last week in the pub she told me that she wasn't so keen on Shakespeare's verse. This week we have a movement workshop and a voice workshop but no actual rehearsals for the third act of the play. We open at the end of next week. And today, while I was preparing to tell my brother, lovely Simon Ridgely, that he was born in the gutter and that that was where he'd end up, in the gutter, Yolan stopped me and said, Lenny, I need you to screw your physical resources up to such a pitch you could just dissolve. Well, I'm working on that. Meanwhile, I have East London to perfect. You must be taking this piss, my son. Oh, and the dangerous lady novelist whose work we are adapting. Well, she came in yesterday. Very crime family, you know. Smokers baritone, charitable donations, salt of the earth. As I remarked to Simon, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are earning a fortune. Are you still there with me? Right, well, what I'm going to do is set them on the road to producing some kind of bridge document. Mm. They looked at the risk assessment procedure and, yeah, they were going to refresh all of that. The other... The, the other... Inter yeah. Yeah. Well, the other interesting thing is asset failure. Transformers that explode or catch fire. And my question to you would be, are there failure frequencies out there for the new gen stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well... Well, what I might do is get Tech Assurance involved and get yourself and myself and the tech guys in a room with Ian Cartwright. Yeah. What... Well, well, my role is project-based. It started out as process safety, but that broadened as soon as the gas component ramped up. Oh, yeah, it ramps up quite quickly, yeah. I mean, sure, Ian's got some ideas, but, but opportunities opportunities to get involved are legion. Hello? When I was nine, I took a swig from the brandy bottle in the cupboard. And as I was trying to wiggle the cork back in, it broke. My parents were fairly strict, but more than that, they were unpredictable. I had the feeling they would deal with me pretty harshly for a petty offence like this. How would they know about it? I didn't stop to think. I was truly terrified and only knew I had to replace the cork, which was special with a little flat hat on it. I knew there was a home brew shop in town, and with the clarity of panicky youth, I realised they might be able to help me. I had enough pocket money. I went to get my pocket money from my room, which I shared with my brother, and he was in there wanking with another boy. I got the cork, and I was so, so relieved when I'd replaced it that I felt I had to cap it all by telling Dad about the funny thing I'd seen Gus doing that afternoon. I 
don't know. I don't know. I don't know, me, Andy Parker, I don't know. They used the free mill through the top floor and the half inch downstairs. That's why you got canking. I don't know what they thought they was doing when they done that, but that's what they done. Listen, I'll do you all half inch through the top, put thermostatic valves on the rads and power flush the whole lot four times. You can do it twice, you can, but I do it four. I won't charge you no extra. I'm already saving you money. I got the valves, yeah. I got them from a mate on that conversion job down the embankment. Oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 then you. It's kosher. Look, I'm just saying where they come from so you know. I ain't robbing ya. I got your address from the moving house slip inside your letter to the Morecams. Alas, Roger and Giselle haven't lived here for seven years. and I wouldn't normally open someone else's mail, but you send a card every Christmas, and it seems unfair of me or them or someone not to let you know. They left me no forwarding address, so I haven't been able to send things on. I hope you can get in touch with them some other way. I know that Roger... Dr. Morecambe, as most of the correspondence has it, went to the University of Warwick because the alumni magazine drops through my letterbox twice a year. It's rather well done, if stuffed with the usual glossy ads for corporate donors and fund management services. I have the same problem with the University of Oxford. They all seem to labour under the delusion that every single one of their graduates has gone to work for a private bank or become a QC or management consultant or top neurosurgeon. Why I alight on neurosurgery in particular, I'm not sure. Some neurosis of my own, no doubt. Giselle is American, isn't she? Are you? I only know because, of course, my neighbours were her neighbours. Dot, Dot Fear, has lived next door her whole life, which is in itself unusual. I tell a small lie. She was in Vancouver for a year in the late 1970s, after she left Clark's. But number 43 has been in her family since 1901. Her grandmother and nine children moved in a week before Queen Victoria died. Dot intimated to me that Giselle wasn't very happy in number 45. It didn't suit her idea of urban living, apparently, although Dr Morecambe was happy enough in the garden. Not bohemian enough for her? Too rough a neighbourhood beyond the confines of the street? People think they want a slice of life until they see how thick cut it is, and then they change their minds. I have an idea that she trained at the Royal Academy, and may even be an academician. Probably just a student. They send her invitations to submit an artist's postcard every October. That much I do know. The idea is that you scrawl something arty on the card, return it, and it's sold anonymously for 50 quid. Hockney, Hodgkin, Hurst, Emin, they all do one. All the in crowd. You could end up with an original work of art. Or not. I did Giselle's for her last year. It was a midnight blue tile with a palm in the middle, and rather good, if I do say so myself. The RA acknowledged it very nicely. I'm glad I made the effort. When I was nine, Everyone was the murderer. My grandmother was the detective, by popular vote. We murdered each other and died laughing. Dad would grope Mum in the bedroom, Arnold would walk around with his arms stuck out like the monster, and Clive would strangle all of us in turn. Every Christmas Day evening. I hid in the corner of the spare room and never wanted the game to end because no one could stop laughing, and it was hysterical and terrifying, and I'd have a coughing fit, and Mum would say... For Ben, you'll do yourself a mischief. But I went on laughing and coughing and the girls screamed. 
And when we went back downstairs, Gran set us off again. She sat there in her pink coat, peeling satsumas, and said, Well, Clive, I think it was you. Or, Don, you look guilty, are you? Golf has nothing to recommend it. At all. I want someone to go round whipping the gloves out of their back pockets. I can't stand those gloves. So that when they reach for them, they're not there. Replace the caddies with complete strangers. I don't know, dinner ladies. People who don't care and can't afford to care. And we could pull the plug on all that money while we're at it. Then we'd see how much they love the game, wouldn't we? Get rid of the man from Motorola with the huge cheque and leave the trophy. The winner gets the trinket and nothing else. That's it. Here's your trophy. No money, no expenses, nothing. Goodbye. The balm of consolation is too strong for some. Its most powerful ingredient is not the emollient lie that time heals, but the more astringent perception that, whether we heal or not, the wound was deep and real and ours. And I had this sudden rush of fondness for her. I thought, allow it! It is pink! Don't though! Seriously! The colour of my bedroom at home! Yeah! No, my other home. <laughs> it's you! You put that thing straight in my head! I'm not joking! You put that thing straight in my head! You're dangerous, you know? You have to look behind the contents of houses, behind the furniture and soft furnishings, the lights and linen cupboards, the radiators that do or don't work, the rotten floorboards showing in the upstairs toilet with the water coming in around the skylight, the colonically twisted plumbing. You have to see through the books and shelves, the boxes of discarded toys, the rocking horse in a corner, the Altrincham FC travel blankets and the durry rugs the tiny working grate in the attic, the Ketter Kolwitz Museum Berlin poster, the unglued Formica kitchen and the study full of lever arch files and drifts of late or never to be filed tax returns, the dark hallway and the unlikely box room choked with bulk bought sink and drain unblocker. You must penetrate all of this drift and dreck to get to the soul of the building, to what it is thinking and saying in many voices, the voices of everyone who has ever lived or died or stayed there, all of whom go on talking after they have moved on with a sort of calm but intangible insistence, like the sound of a radio being reasonable in an empty room. The lads are wearing suits, which draw attention to the spots around their lips, and the girls are still experimenting with makeup, putting it on too thick, and there are some trim mums and one thin, very inebriated grandmother, dressed too youthfully, sweeping and swaying to doctor pressure. White ties with big knots go with black shirts, the lads have decided, and some tentative carpet boogie is the necessary preliminary to joining the two or three brave girls already on the postage stamp sized dance floor, from which the defiant grandmother has just retired in a fit of weeping expectoration. One bloke fancies himself as a dancer, but at this stage in the evening restricts himself to a few pelvic rotations, while talking at the bar to a girl in a tight, crushed blue bodice, perched awkwardly on a stool. She is telling him about a dream involving a vampire, a woman with an eating disorder who looks like Linda, she points at the weeping granny, and an angry face at the window. 
She thinks it's about balance, and just as she says the word balance, the bloke listening to her does a little spin and has to reach out for the bar when he comes back round and cover his embarrassment by saying, Go on, I'm listening, vampires! To which the girl responds by taking a sip of her wine and looking down at her shoes. I don't know anyone. I'm in Watton, staying with a friend who's a medical courier and a part-time DJ. He knows the DJ at this party, which is why we're here. Lads start to dance towards the end of a song, I've noticed, rather than near the beginning. This way, they don't have to dance for long and can duck out quickly if they haven't made or feel they're unlikely to make the right impression. Certain songs and singers get blokes going, just in Timberlake, for instance, because he's bringing sexy back, but not to Norfolk, so no competition. For similar reasons, a good gay dancer is an excellent investment. He can be guaranteed to get people to focus their attention on the dance floor. No one wants to be like him. He's too good, too gay. But while he holds everyone's attention, the more self-conscious majority of the blokes can join him and the girls in the safe knowledge that their own moves will be less obvious, less open to scrutiny and therefore more alluring. The semi-professional gay dance teacher is an encouraging distraction, in other words, and when he's done his 40 minutes, he can fuck off, can't he, and hang around the sports centre corridor while his medical courier friend buys everyone else a drink. And it's while he's out there thinking, what the... that he's joined by the bloke from the bar, who isn't gay and isn't coming on to him, but is lost. They, we, have a very ordinary, quite friendly conversation about nothing. Gary's birthday, how I know Wes, where I learned to dance. And I realise I've gone and put him out of a job. He was going to be the one to get everyone dancing. And he wouldn't have been quite as gaily good as me, quite as different. So he would have had some interest from the girls and now he's missed out. The others have piled on in and no one cares about the moves anymore. On an impulse I say, that girl you were talking to, she was nice. And he mumbles something before his face clouds over. He's just started at Travis Perkins down the road. He works in the tool hire office. She's four years older and she's got her eyes on the boss all right. Fair play to her. What boss, I say, and push him back through the doors. And he's bright pink but smiling. So Dr. Pressure comes on again and the lad meets her eyes and cocks his head at the dance floor and she makes her excuses to the fat dad all over her and goes to meet the unpredictable new recruit from tool hire on a just big enough square of light.
The Absent Therapist was written and read by Will Eaves, with music composed and played by the author. Sound engineering was by Mark Lingwood. It was produced by Bibi Berkey and brought to you by Tempest Productions.